you for your patience. Uh, welcome to the Parsons Communication Design Lecture Series for Spring 2024. My name is Lynn Kyung, and I'm co-director of the MPSCD uh, program that's in Communication Design. The CD Lecture Series allows CD students to meet design thinkers and practitioners within the discipline and adjacent fields. And we have an exciting lineup of speakers scheduled for this semester. You can learn more about the upcoming lecture from the CD app and watch past lectures on our YouTube channel. Our next lecture will be by Silvio LaRusso on Thursday, April 4th via Zoom. And today's speaker is Eric Lee, and I'll be introducing him today. Eric Lee is a designer, software engineer, and educator based in New York. He's the senior digital product director at the Eames Institute, where he oversees a team of designers and software developers who design and build the Institute's digital products used to share the lessons and collection of Ray and Charles Eames with the world. He also teaches interaction design and computer science at Parsons and is one half of Erkan Lee. Prior to the Eames Institute, Eric was a senior product designer and developer at MoMA, where he led product design, front end, and digital strategy for the museum's website and digital platforms, winning a Webby in 2023 for his work on the museum's new tab browser extension. Eric's been privileged to work with ORG, Google Design, IDEO, and Lust, and has taught at RISD. Uh, I'm also really honored to have him teach at the MPSCD program and type in interaction, please. Uh, Join me in greeting Eric. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Lynn. It was very sweet. Um, so as she, Lynn said, my name is Eric Lee. I am the Senior Digital Product Director at the Eames Institute. I'm really excited to be here today and kind of share some of my work and my process as well. So today I want to talk about two main things. Um, the first is my practice as it stands today. Um, this is kind of what I think about when I think of a practice for myself. Uh, it consists of teaching, my studio practice, and my day job. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is how I ended up getting here, so kind of the process by which I arrived at this practice that I think works really well for me. And as I was putting together this talk, um, something that I kept going back to was this question of why do I do what I do? Um, and it gets a little bit more complicated in that. Uh, it's more like why do I care about why I do what I do? Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, of course I understand that I really enjoy working in design. I like working across disciplines. Um, I like working in cultural work, thinking deeply about problems across physical and digital spaces. Um, but really, like, understanding a bit more about why, you know, like, why do I actually care about that? Um, and I think for those who are kind of current students, this is also really important for you to think about as you're thinking about what's next, kind of not only Kind of everyone probably will go into some form of a career in design, but really taking a step back and thinking about what it is that drives you to kind of do the work that you're interested in and understanding the nuances to that. Okay, so this is kind of like a broad collection of some of the projects I've worked on in my time practicing as a designer so far. It kind of ranges from Websites, as you might expect, to data visualization, to like weird installations in electrical generating plants, to 3D printed type. Um, and I will say that like through all of the work that I'm going to kind of share today, um, none of it kind of happens in a vacuum. A lot of it happens through collaboration, conversation with people who I will try to mention as I go through this, but I'm sure I will forget a couple of people. But I think that's really important to also understand that, you know, although I'm here speaking today, a lot of this happens because of conversations and collaborations with others. Right, so we're gonna rewind the clock a little bit um, and go back to my sophomore year of college. Um, I was studying computer science. I kind of had drank the Kool-Aid on working at a tech company and kind of had teed it all up to go work in big tech. So 
That summer, I interned at a place in California. You may have heard of it. It's called Google. And I was working in Google Research on some kind of machine learning pipelines for uh, the Google Play Store. And you know, it was really interesting work, but ultimately, I found the work a little bit uninspiring for myself. Um, and at the same time, I had been taking this class at Princeton, which is where I went to college. Um, I had this one role that I would kind of take a class in a different discipline every semester, um, just to kind of broaden my horizons a little bit. And one of those was a class called Visual Form, taught by David Reinfurt. Um, that was kind of my first design class, if you will. And one of the assignments in that class was to create a project that talked about the differences between the RGB and CMYK color spaces. Uh, the reason why I kind of am spending some time on this is because for me, I consider it kind of one of the first pieces of design I ever produced. And it definitely doesn't look like your traditional design project, so to speak. Um, and I kind of you know, don't really consider myself a traditional artist designer in the sense that I'm good at like painting or drawing or any of that. And uh, through kind of the material in this course, I found a way into design. And so uh, what you have here on the left is a kind of pixel that I created. It's an RGB LED that you can kind of turn some knobs to adjust the color. Um, it's connected to an Arduino. And then when you print a button, it prints out that value and on an inkjet printer. Uh, and it was all kind of done with an Arduino and very haphazard. But nonetheless, I thought it was like an interesting an exciting project that really got me excited about design as a discipline. So uh, that summer, I was like, you know, Google, great place and all, uh, but a little bit more like not entirely sure if that was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So um, I ended up at a studio in the Netherlands called Lust. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures that I took during that time. Um, Lust is a studio based in The Hague. Uh, it was run by three people, Jeroen Veranse, Dimitri Neuenhausen, and Thomas Castro. Um, and in that picture, in this picture, uh, it's a fellow intern, Vera van der uh, Lust was really exciting because for me, it was kind of a place to explore some of the ideas I was thinking about more. Uh, for those who don't know, Lust is kind of, was known for kind of creating more critical, interesting cultural work uh, that kind of existed for cultural institutions in the Netherlands. Um, and a lot of their work also straddled the boundaries between design and technology. Uh, one of the projects I worked on during that time was this kind of digital installation display up in the north of Nether the Netherlands. It was a project that the architect had commissioned the Dutch designer Carl Martens to work on, and he had asked Lust to help with the technical implementation of this project. And so I kind of joined near the end of the project and helped with fine tuning some of the interaction, some of the technology, and kind of little animation movements there. Uh, this is like a very specific shot looking at the pixels at a bit more closer detail, and you can kind of see that up close are not actually pixels, but were these specific patterns that uh, Carl had designed, and kind of we had wrote custom programming to help run them. Uh, another project that I worked on at Lust was a data visualization project. Um, this was part of a larger European Union-funded project that was around uh, how security and attackers can kind of gain access to a company um, within the European Union. And one of the people that we worked with was Verizon, or companies that we worked with was a researcher at Verizon. And we kind of collaborated on this report that they were putting out and creating like an alternative way of looking at how people might kind of attack a specific company. Um, what I really like about this was it kind of was using a, di a graph that Martin Wattenberg, um, who's a researcher and data visualization scientist, uh, had developed and just trying to explore what a different way to view this content might look like. And kind of clicking in on each of the circles reveals more information. And that level of like revealing more information, the deeper you drill down, is a bit um, 
is known as a concept that I'd later learn is called progressive disclosure, something that we used quite a bit at MoMA. Uh, and then another project I worked on at Lust was this project called the Modular Body, which was an interactive weird digital art installation that was created by the Dutch artist Floris Kijk. And Lust had been asked to create a kind of media interactive to go with that piece. And so uh, what we created was kind of this cloud of videos, video fragments that Flores had come together, put together and produced. And um, it was kind of a nonlinear narrative structure that would ask the user to visit the website and kind of watch these tiny little video fragments and kind of understand um, and form their own kind of narrative of this larger project around like a mad scientist growing a body in a lab. And in some ways, it kind of predates uh, how we consume media now uh, with TikTok and Reels and all that stuff. Um, after my time at Lust, um, I went back to Google. Uh, this was kind of part of my year off, so kind of bookended by Google on both sides, uh, this time in New York City, where I worked on the material design team. Um, this was around 2016, and material design as kind of a concept was kind of just becoming a thing. Um, obviously, design systems have existed for a long time, but uh, Google kind of was positioning itself to be a leader in the like design scene itself. And so with material design as kind of this design system that uh, had just come out, Google was also sponsoring these talks and conferences. And so I worked with a team of designers, Rob Jim Petro, Damien Carell, Paul Schlachter, and a bunch of others on this website for Google Span in LA and also a, another website for the version in Tokyo. Uh, this was really interesting just to see how the design process works at a larger company. Um, definitely different things to consider and even how like code gets deployed is very different than when we were at last and sometimes we would just drag folders onto a server and that'd be it. During that time I also did some weird stuff like doing text corrections for the span reader um, of code and also designing this random number generator in Google search. And so throughout all of this, I was thinking about all the different kind of experiences I had um, working at a small studio like Lust. You kind of get to be exposed to really interesting ways of working, really interesting projects, really pushing the boundaries of what design as a discipline can be. And kind of on the flip side, you have a place like Google, large company, uh, really big impact. You know, like you work on stuff that reaches billions of people, but the work that you do is usually a lot more limited in scope. And I'd say that even like the Span website that I worked on was maybe more the exception than the norm. And so I was thinking about what to do next, kind of collecting data points on projects and work that that I would kind of help inform what I wanted to do after graduation, and so I was like, maybe a mid-sized agency would be a good idea. And so that's how I found myself at IDEO in Palo Alto, California. Uh, IDEO is probably most famous for two things. One is the industrial design of the Macintosh mouse, and the other for evangelizing design thinking. Um, I wanted to learn a bit more about what it'd be like to work at a mid-sized commercial, this was kind of like the more commercial side of the design industry, um, and just learn a bit more about how a company like Audio works and functions. Uh, I can't really talk too much about the projects I worked on there, but I will say that what was interesting to me about Audio was uh, initially it was an experience that I wasn't such a big fan of, but kind of even like knowing that about myself was useful, and then some of the methodologies and tools that I learned from my time there have since become I found really useful, in, even in my current job. So that brings me to my senior year of college. This is me in my studio. Um, it's not exactly the cleanest studio, but that's OK. Uh, you can see there's cheese zips, a bunch of LaCroix. Um, good time. And I shared it with my studio mate, Jonathan Zong. Jonathan and I are are really good friends, and we also did a bunch of collaborations together in the studio. Uh, one of these 
projects is on the left. It was a project called Interface Your Face. Um, and that was a podcast. So Jonathan and I found that like, for us, talking about design was really useful and kind of pushed our creative practice and allowed us to make interesting things. And so, and it's so much that we thought that talking about design was, in fact, an act of design in and of itself. Uh, at the same time, Jarrett Fuller, uh, who has his podcast, Scratching the Surface, was kind of making that a thing. And we decided to kind of do a gentle jab in that direction and create Interface Your Face with kind of a similar kind of dulcet intro music that Jonathan put together. And you can still find these on Spotify. I apologize in advance if you do seek it out, because it is very unedited. And good luck. Um, on the right is a poster that I did for an artist talk for the designers Julie Peters and Scott Ponick. Um, I was asked to kind of put together a poster for this talk without too many constraints. And so kind of what I decided was to just take some of the work that I was doing in my own self-initiated practice and kind of put it all together onto this poster. So one of them is a typeface that I created called Monty Sands, which was basically a piece of institutional critique. Uh, looking at how Princeton's like identity used serifs as a way to give itself legitimacy and kind of printing that out and very much cutting off the serifs and rescanning that typeface. And the second was a project that I was thinking about with the essay Dispersion by Seth Price, where I was scanning and rescanning the output to kind of break it down into its resonant parts. And so I'd say that like one of the great things that I appreciated about my time in, I guess, art school is that it allowed for the freedom to explore and kind of treat different surfaces as a way to see how your ideas were landing without necessarily dealing with the real consequences of a client being upset about it being nonsensical, for example. Um, I also uh, kind of wrapped up my senior year with this, which is my senior thesis. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to do for my thesis. and kind of grinding a lot of gears. And ultimately, what I realized was that um, for me, like design itself is, the, the, is not super important. What's more important is the act of, as you might have um, noticed, like talking about design, the process, the artifacts, in a way, are secondary to kind of the conversations and the way you think about design. And so I was very kind of specific in how I installed my thesis, choosing to mount these giant half-inch foam core tombstones, which are kind of the wall labels that you see next to a piece of art at a museum that talks about like the work and usually is a description about it. Um, mounting that on the wall and kind of creating this hierarchy of having me talking about the work on the wall as the thing that the viewer should really be focusing on, and then kind of creating a secondary level of hierarchy by collecting all of the work I had produced during my time in college, as well as kind of random artifacts I had collected, just kind of throwing it all on the plinth and being like, here's like the visual thing that accompanies the broader thinking about the thesis. And I'd say that like with thesis, um, I know a lot of you or some of you are wrapping up yours right now. I always found thesis is like a really useful tool as a way to be like, it's like the time to be really selfish and to like use it as a tool to understand what you want to do with your future, what you want to untangle before you kind of get into real life, so to speak. Uh, the title of my thesis was called What's True Form? Uh, it's based off an essay by Max Bell that talks about why designers design. And he kind of makes the argument that designers are constantly designing the same thing because they're in pursuit of this like unachievable true form. But also, at the same time, I was a little bit like WTF as well, as in what was I going to do when I graduated? Uh, a lot of different options. You know, there was like this idea of going to grad school, uh, maybe just like giving up in design and going back and working in tech. Um, the like allure of having an independent practice, always an arm's length away, or just like going and working as a designer. Um, and something I realized during the kind of experience I had collected so far was that a lot of the work that I enjoyed doing spanned across design and software. It wasn't really an either or situation. So um, that's how I ended up finding myself at ORG, uh, David's studio practice, where I had been interning 
one day a week as a senior and kind of started spending more time there when I graduated. Um, this is a picture of the basement in the Lower East Side. And I worked on a whole bunch of things. I'll go kind of quickly through this. Uh, one of these was the ORG Small Software Shop, in which we tried to sell screensavers in printed form that you could download, obviously, but it was kind of this weird, like, let's see how many people buy software still in physical form. And you know, screensavers are their own kind of weird antiquity in a way where they're not really useful anymore. They were created to kind of solve a very real problem of screen burn-in, but most screens nowadays don't even need that. And so it basically is also like proof of that in that every time a new version of Mac OS comes out, they break and someone has to remake them. Um, I also cut my teeth a little bit on print design, learned what a baseline grid was. That was exciting. Uh, these were some booklets I did with David for the Yale School of Architecture. Uh, we also worked on the website for the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London with Sir Bertolotti Bailey, who was the head of design at the ICA then. Little did I know that this would be the first of many cultural institutional websites that I would end up working on. Also part of that project were these digital screens that hung in the lobby behind people at the desk. Again, not knowing that that would be one of many digital screens that ran on websites that I'd make in my career so far. Another project we worked on was a proposal for a Martin Luther King Jr. and Curtis Scott King Memorial in Boston Commons, um, where we kind of created this typeface that emphasized the speeches of the kings in a different level, where we take into account the volume at which they were speaking and creating and adjusting the depth of the type embedded into the metal marble plinths as a way of having the viewer also understand um, where they were placing emphasis on in their speeches. And so this was kind of a scale model that was at the Design Museum in London. And this is kind of a gif of how that kind of actually came together. Um, so I did that for about a year. And I was kind of curious about what it'd be like to work at a larger cultural institution. Um, and just understanding what it would mean to be at a place like MoMA. And so uh, I had, was very lucky, applied to a job as a developer on the team there and ended up joining the museum in 2019 in the middle of their kind of large uh, renovation project where the museum actually closed for a couple months and we were kind of putting the final touches. Um, at the same time, I believe Rob Jean Petro had joined MoMA. Uh, I worked with him at Google, and now he was the design director at MoMA, where he worked with the design studio order on every brand of the museum's identity. Um, when I joined, one of the projects that I worked on was a kind of interpretation of that identity uh, for the website. And so I worked really closely with Michael Fehrenbach, who some of you know as my co-teacher in the MPS program and longtime collaborator. Um, this was kind of the first project that we worked on together. And I learned a lot about what it means to work on a team across kind of design and technology and like how you work in a really small scale. The digital media team was, I believe, six or seven people and kind of had to do a lot with, a little, with not a lot. Uh, we touched on things like uh, page turners in the galleries that allowed people to interact with printed material that you couldn't normally touch and also screens. Again, um, I had a, a distinct memory of laying on the floor at 1 or 2 AM of the, at the museum while Michael was noodling on these screens. And I don't know, it was like a fun time. Uh, so these screens were kind of these wayfinding pieces within the museum. They worked in tandem with the physical wayfinding signage. Um, here is like an elevator screen directory screen with kind of these ultra-wide uh, screens behind uh, desks in the lobby. Uh, here's another view of the screens. I'd say that this is maybe a very interesting, if unexpected, view of the screens, which is them running in Safari. Uh, and it turns out that the screens themselves are actually websites. Uh, and the reason why we did this was kind of twofold. A big reason was that we found that design was just becoming a pretty big bottleneck in terms of like has, passing off design to developers and back to design. And so we decided that it would make a lot of sense to kind of 
codify and build out a lot of these kind of rules and decisions within the code base itself. So Michael and I worked really closely for maybe half a year on a library that we called Sol, after Sol LeWitt, and it kind of embeds all the stuff you would normally see in a design system, like in Figma, components, taunts, spacing, et cetera, as actual uh, CSS classes and a framework that you could actually use uh, within code itself. And that really allowed kind of designers and developers to speak the same language. And I'd say like this was like a big reason why even now, like as I like later get into like some of my teaching stuff, why I think design and software are so kind of intertwined and why like at Parsons, I think like for me, like teaching programming more rigorously allows for both designers to be better partners with developers and vice versa. Um, you know, we did things like having really tight typography, baseline alignment, um, actually cinching the type down to the cap height of type. Um, and then we also worked on other stuff. So this was kind of the first time that I started doing product design. It's like capital P product design. Um, this was a project I worked on with Stephanie Chapelwall and is a kind of us looking at the artist pages and kind of the more collection-y part of the website and understanding how our users, what we're actually using the website. And so kind of bringing a bit of kind of the more like user-based approach into uh, what had previously been more of a visual specific process. Um, that was also a moment for us to also think about how the design system at MoMA evolves as well um, from having, you know, here's like Claude Monet's water lilies on the left in kind of a more like, you're looking at the piece of art, and so you should be looking at the full piece of the art. Whereas on the right, it's more of a marketing context, and so kind of allowing us the license to kind of crop on the work itself. And so we worked together on kind of a redesign of the artist page, introducing kind of features and also new approaches to the brand that kind of evolved people's experiences with the website. So that was my time at MoMA. Um, I kind of was there for three and a half years, and as I started thinking about what came next after that, I realized that definitely a lot of my experiences were leaning more on the left side of the spectrum. And uh, I realized that from all these experiences, I kind of came up with a list of things I really wanted to have in my next role. I wanted to be able to work on interesting conceptual work. I wanted to be able to think deeply and evolve a product over periods of time or products. I wanted to be able to wear multiple hats across different disciplines, to continue to grow and learn and participate in a design discourse, and to work across multiple mediums, both physical and print. And what I realized was that that doesn't actually have to be the same job. In fact, I realized that it's better to have kind of, I guess, a triangle, or you know, you may have like a polygon of different sides, uh, whatever works for you. But what worked for me was kind of realizing that like a practice that is composed of teaching, studio practice, and a day job was really useful and helped me kind of pull lessons from each of these sides of my practice to help inform the other. And so like in a real kind of lens of that, um, it'd be having teaching be Parsons, my studio practice as Ara John Lee, and my day job at the Eames Institute. Um, I will say that this diagram is slightly misleading in the fact that like this is equally weighted, when in fact this is probably a more accurate description of how my time is spent. And I think one thing to, that's really important to think about as like you like consider this within the context of your own work is that this is constantly fluid too. So right now my time is mostly spent at the Eames Institute. Uh, it wasn't always like that. Certain times I was full on teaching, other times I was full on uh, working on studio practice or writing. And so I think it's important to understand that your practice is also a constant, mo constantly moving dynamic practice. So I'm gonna focus on one project from each of the sides of this triangle, um, starting with Ar John Lee. So uh, Ar John Lee is a practice that I run with Nazar Arjan. Uh, we met in 
18. And in fact, we had actually gone to the same school together, but just did not know of each other. And apparently, Nazla said that I was once very annoying to her in front of a photocopier in the graphic design classroom. So I guess you can overcome some disagreements like that. Um, this is a studio portrait that was taken by our friend Sydney King. Um, and our practice kind of is really relatively small, and we do a lot of kind of self-initiated work. One of these was a project um, that we were invited to contribute to, uh, an open letters proposal for the Brotere Society of America, where we were invited to produce kind of amongst a bunch of other artists um, a contemporary take on an open letter in the context of Marcel Brotere's larger body of work with open letters within the Museum of Modern Art Department of Eagles in France. And for those who don't know, an open letter is kind of a letter addressed to a person, place, body, company, whoever, but it's kind of open in nature, so kind of anyone can read it as well. So it has multiple audiences. Uh, at the same time, if you remember fall of 2022, was when ChatGPT and OpenAI was kind of coming on the scene. And so, you know, reading responses that were obviously AI generated that students thought they could pass off, but clearly were AI generated, uh, that was kind of the heyday of AI. And something that I was starting to kind of think more and was also something that was coming more on the scene was how uh, the data that feeds these large language models, uh, where does it come from? Uh, this is an article where the Times is suing OpenAI and Microsoft for using their copyrighted work. And so we wanted to kind of create an open letter that operated within this discourse and kind of in, itself, in a way itself resisted photocopying or kind of dissemination uh, into a large language model. And so another thing we came across during that time was this uh, symbol here. It's called the Orion constellation after the constellation. Orion or Orion, and this is spelled E-U-R-I-O-N, uh, Orion. And uh, it's most commonly found, or in fact, almost exclusively found on currency. Uh, originally on the Euro note, which is how it gets its name, it also exists on US dollars and kind of almost every piece of currency in the world. And it was created as an anti-counterfeiting measure. So kind of if you wanted to photocopy a dollar bill or Photoshop a dollar bill, the technology would recognize this pattern and kind of prevent you from photocopying or duplicating that material. Uh, and so we wanted to use that as a way of kind of informing an open letter that people could read, but uh, machines could not. And so we decide, uh, designed this kind of word mark, watermark for the open letters that would be printed on every letter that was sent out and wrote this kind of piece of text that just talks a little bit about how one should consider how text is being used and disseminated within the age of kind of large language models and how your data really is kind of consumed by everything and how you might be able to resist it. Um, and so this is kind of what it looks like on the left typeset. Uh, it was resograph printed and then on the right is what it actually looks like when it's scanned by a photocopier. So really meant for human consumption only. Uh, the second part of the triangle, Parsons, is I'll talk a little bit about a project that I consider design, which is my teaching practice. Um, this was the first class I ever taught at Parsons. Casper Lamb, who was the director of the program, had invited me to um, teach after a unrelated conversation around ticketing. and. Uh, that was kind of a funny like circumstance that ended up with me teaching core interaction too uh, with Sophie Alger teaching the studio portion. Um, one thing that I realized during that semester was that um, how foundational kind of a more technical curriculum was to a design education. And one of the things I realized was that I basically retaught the core one interaction curriculum again in core two because students were kind of coming from a bunch of different uh, places from the previous semester. Uh, Casper and I talked about this and I ended up writing over the summer a curriculum assessment and kind of looking at core interaction through the lens of other programs that were kind of trying to do the same thing. 
um, and really like thinking about teaching as an act of design in and of itself. Uh, and a couple of the takeaways that came out of that research was un understanding and ensuring that programming exercises are actually part of the curriculum. Students are all doing the same assignments. Uh, the suggestion that maybe core one and core two could be kind of one large curriculum, uh, and even going so far as to having the same students and instructors over the two semesters. Uh, also suggesting that like having class, out of class time, and even CD tutors um, act as kind of equal tenets to a design education around interaction and programming. And so where did I go with these ideas? Those ended up making their way into these two classes here. On the left is a class that Michael and I teach, Typing Interaction. A um, bunch of you are here today, so now you understand why this course is the way it is. Um, Michael and I, kind of within the context of this broader thinking, decided that it would make a lot of sense to try out what it'd be to teach a course over one year, um, have everyone learn the same material instead of have each other in different sections, and then kind of have the same assignment over time. Uh, on the right is a class I teach in the undergrad program, C Studio JavaScript. Um, the course description is that this is a computer science class first and a design class second, kind of deferring to all the other programs and classes uh, for the actual design part of the education. And so I was kind of made the conscious choice of being really rigorous with this program and with this class and kind of enforcing the idea that like actually like usually in design school and art school there's not really a right or wrong there's just like a lot of gray area uh, and kind of enforcing that in fact with programming there's actually a right or wrong answer so these are some of the assignments that I created for this class um, the third one in body is like uh, an assignment where students are asked to create an orbital dynamics simulation so Michael likes to joke that the class is actually an orbital dynamics class third. Uh, one of the assignments that I asked the students to do is to create a garden. Um, and so this is a very rudimentary garden that people create in using HTML elements. And on the right is something called an auto grader. So kind of asking students to both kind of do the same assignment, understanding that there's actually a right or wrong answer and then providing feedback as they're doing the assignments as well. Um, this is some of the work that came out of that class um, or that specific assignment. Lots of different takes. Special shout out to Alex's frog, which has made its way into many different places that you would not expect. Um, and then the final assignment for that class was to design and develop a piece of software that lets you use the internet mindfully. And this was really like a project that was based around an essay that Lowell Schulz wrote around what a website can be um, and kind of evolving that to also take into account some of the process that one actually encounters during their time working at a actual place. So understanding that like design doesn't exist in a vacuum, you're working with other people, other designers, other stakeholders and wanting to make something meaningful. So kind of asking students to create a proposal, make sketches, use their test those sketches, uh, write code, and present. All of those were kind of factors in their final grade. And really understanding that in real life design is maybe 30% of your job, if you're lucky. And a lot of it is also talking about your work, presenting your work, getting people on board with your work, et cetera. Uh, and finally, the last part of this triangle is the Eames Institute. So these two lovely people are Ray and Charles Eames. They are a married couple who are most famous for the chairs and furniture that they designed. Um, so some of you may recognize this work. Uh, you probably all sat in an Eames designed piece of furniture at one point or another, whether it was real or a knockoff. We can talk about that after this lecture. But you probably recognize this body of work. The Eameses, I'd say, were not only furniture designers, but they also worked in creating exhibitions, videos, and really worked interdisciplinarily. Uh, when they passed away, they gave their collection, they kind of passed on their collection and the work that they produced at their studio uh, to their daughter, Lucia Eames, who then moved that up to Petaluma, California, and built this, which is the Eames Ranch. And it was designed by William Trimble and 
up until recently housed a collection. So the Eames Institute, a uh, relatively new organization, only a couple years old, is really focused on the lessons and collection of Rain Charles Eames, and also showcasing the work of designers who are practicing today and kind of promoting that legacy, um, which is a very dynamic legacy, I'd say. Um, within that is the comms and creative team. So the communications and creative team is one of several or, like bigger orgs or teams at the Eames Institute um, where we really focus on things like editorial, design, digital, obviously, and marketing. And then kind of within that, the digital product team, which is composed of me, Piper Haywood, Dylan Fisher, Michael Ferenbach, again, Fabio de Paolo, and Matt Heinrich, um, focus really on the digital surfaces of the organization. So that's obviously the website, but kind of touches on a bunch of different parts as well. And so last year, we moved the bulk of the collection from the Eames Ranch to our warehouse in Richmond, California, in kind of preparation for larger work to be done at that property. So we moved all of the collection to Richmond. It kind of served as two purposes. The first was as our new headquarters, and the second was as a place for people to actually visit and, and engage with the collection. So I would be remiss not to mention this woman in the middle. This is Lisa Demetrius. She is the youngest granddaughter of Rain Charles Eames and also our chief curator. And she's the one that kind of gives the tours to the people who want to go on the tours. And this is kind of a really beautiful picture um, that was captured of her giving a tour. So while all of this was happening kind of in the physical realm, let's say, um, we had to figure out what we were doing uh, in the digital realm. The website at this point was like pretty much the about page, our magazine Kazam, a uh, collection of art exhibitions and artifacts, and a page about the ranch. And so this was, in fact, like, oh, let's just add a page to the website for Richmond it was not actually such an easy task. Um, we had to understand why we were adding the page, what it was called. Um, and in fact, what I realized was that design itself is actually a really useful way to kind of give a concrete surface for other decisions to be made on. And so the website was not, there was no exception to that. Uh, we kind of had to take this amorphous add a visit page or add a page for Richmond to the website and turn it into something concrete that people would actually get utility out of. And so kind of to do that, um, we had this workshop. Um, There's a mix of people on the creative team and other stakeholders where we more or less pulled out all of the visual part of design and looked at it kind of at its core type and content hierarchy. So this was like an information architecture workshop. And a lot of this was done also in the service of just getting everyone aligned and on board with the work that we were doing. Uh, we started that workshop by just having people put up post-its of what they wanted the page to be, ease of use, visual beauty, compelling storytelling, a place for visitors to have their questions answered, a peek into some of the collection, and potentially the ability to buy something from us. Uh, kind of after that, one of the things that we also started using were these personas. Um, so for those who don't know, personas are kind of ways for people to focus a bit more on like a human-centered approach. Uh, again, something that I learned, an idea that I thought I'd never use again, and here I am using that to, I'd say, like very great success. Um, and it was like a great way for everyone to have their voice heard uh, without necessarily having to like have a specific decision be pinned to like, I think this, I think that. So allowing us to kind of think through the lens of someone else. And so we had personas like, locals, uh, tourists, academics, corporate people who wanted to go there for a retreat, non-locals, and our favorite, which is the plus one, who doesn't really want to be there, but kind of has to because someone else brought them there. Uh, we broke that out into kind of breakout groups with different people tackling like what each person or persona wanted to see on that page, and then kind of consolidated that back into um, this hierarchy on the right. And so that hierarchy basically more or less became the final product, um, which is pretty remarkable if you think about 
um, how much sometimes designs can churn or change uh, throughout a process. And so as we're going through this kind of visit page, you can see like we have a tours, we have our getting here section, we have our FAQ, and we have a learn more. And so it's kind of very much almost exactly the same as what we kind of expected it to be. With, of course, like the added visual form of it all. Um, I think we also use that opportunity as an opportunity to do a kind of evolution of the website's brand um, and have it be a bit more closer in line to the design identity that the firm manual based in SF had given to the organization. So that is my practice, the three sides of it. I think what is really useful to think about is how uh, all of them inform the other. I think teaching, I found, has really helped me become better at running workshops and like sharing things out. The idea of having to break things down and make them really understandable, especially technical material, ends up being really, really useful when you're trying to explain that to a bunch of non-technical stakeholders as well, as just one example. And I'll kind of end on this picture of the ranch looking over of the farm that we have, and with this idea that, of crop rotation. So this was an idea that I can't take credit for. The designer, Peter Mendelssohn, when he came to give a talk, um, kind of talked about his practice as an act of crop rotation, which is the idea that um, you can't really spend too much time on one specific piece of land, or else it'll kind of run out of nutrients. You have to kind of give that land a chance to rest and work on other land and eventually, as it kind of gets its nutrients back, you go back to that land, and there's new ideas, new ways of thinking about things. And I think that is a really great way to think about a practice. Thank you. and answer. I think it, we could project loud enough that we can kind of hear and Eric can answer. So feel free to raise your hand and just speak out, shall we? I'm happy to also repeat questions as we do. Any questions? Yeah. I might need you to repeat that. <laughs> Did you hear? Here, let's. Hello. Okay. Um, for your work for the Ames Institute, has there been um, any work done to uh, archive artifacts in some kind of database? Yeah, I'd say like that's something that is actively in progress. The website was kind of created at a specific point in time where we were just inventorying a couple of objects in the collection. And the hope is that one day we'll have kind of a fully online collection with all the objects in the collection available for everyone. But that's definitely a long process, for sure. Hi, um, you did a lot of stuff uh, throughout your life, like the software designing, software engineering and designing. How did you, like, even in your designing, you had a lot of digital stuff. So how did you manage to uh, do both the ways, like doing your designing practices and along with that, keeping the software learnings with you? Because after some time, you forget things, but you had everything going on at the same time. That is a very good question. Uh, I would say I have not yet figured out a good balance, so I kind of end up doing a lot of both, um, mm -hmm. much to the chagrin of my partner. Um, oh. And I'd say, like, ideally, like, so the way I think about like software is like it's a medium through which design happens, and so that framework for me is really useful to then understand like software is no different than like Illustrator or InDesign or any other tool, and 
kind of starting with a design or an idea and using um, you know tools at my disposal, even trying to learn a new tool um, to kind of get to that goal of that design. And I'd say like that also kind of informs why and how I teach. Um, especially in JavaScript, I try to teach more concepts than anything specific because fundamentally those are like concepts that don't change as much as kind of the like hot new library of the day for JavaScript or whatnot. Just one more question. Um, how, like, what is your process? Uh, do you, if you find something new and it's very interesting and it's an accidental thing and then you go forward with a project with that particular thing or is it like you have an idea and then you go forward with the tool? What is the process? Like, how does it work? Do you have the idea first and then go forward? Or do you just play around with it and then make your idea around that fun thing that you invented? Or I mean, it kind of depends, which okay. is like the best answer, right? Um, but I'd say, like, depending on the context, uh, you kind of draw from different uh, sources. So, like, with uh, our town for example, it very much is like a research-based practice where we're looking at other things that inform our design, um, motifs, et cetera. And in a way, like the best approach there is to kind of land on something that feels like so obviously right that it becomes the design. I'd say with some of the like more like product stuff that I do, like both at uh, the Ames Institute and previously at MoMA, is more around like understanding the needs of who's actually using the website and kind of having like small moments of visual intervention, but also like having it really be focused on like accomplishing a specific goal or a specific journey or whatever thing that we're trying to accomplish and having that really be couched in like a mix of other references. So like looking at how other places are doing things when we were working on the visit page, we looked at like 20, 30 pages of other websites that were doing similar things, understanding what was working well, what we thought wasn't, and then also like what was specific to our use case that kind of necessitated a different way of thinking about things. Thank you. Hi, Eric. Um, as someone who like comes from and now works in two like very different like fields that like value different things, how do you determine your project's successful? And has that like changed as you've worked more? How do I determine if what is successful? Your projects. It depends, <laughs> again. <laughs> um, you know, like I'd say that one thing that Nas and I realized with our practice was that we didn't really like doing client work for people. Um, Working as like a freelancer in the cultural sector generally does not pay a lot of money, and we didn't really want to deal with kind of the trials and tribulations of like an annoying client, and so we kind of very much decided that that practice would be really focused on self-initiated work um, as a way for us to kind of do other things. Nasla has a job at the Walker as a designer as well, and I'd say if you think about say some of the work with MoMA or with the Eames Institute, uh, there are also specific things that you want to look at. So like with the visit page, for example, there's like maybe more specific metrics around we want people to buy tickets. Uh, and so a metric of success might be getting people to buy tickets, whereas uh, other parts of the website, which are a bit more informative, uh, maybe less of a product or less marketing and more producty or more around getting people to spend more time on the page, to like click through to other parts of the page, to kind of think about uh, their journey in different ways. Anybody else that's got anything? Firstly, thank you for this wonderful uh, introduction. And I'm a rising sophomore, so uh, I'm uh, wondering where we'll be teaching in Core Y Interaction next, next semester. Yeah. Uh, I will get back to Kelly, and we'll see what happens. OK. 
<laughs> um, if you can quickly think, what was your favorite thing you made at Princeton? What was my favorite time at Princeton? Favorite what? <laughs> Favorite thing I made? That's a very good question. I would say that maybe the most interesting thing, or like one of the things I like, was very, I don't know, like proud of, or has continued to be something that has had a life of its own, was kind of the like brand, I guess, that I had developed for the visual arts program. Um, that was kind of, it actually came out of like a website project where I was trying to make a website for the program for students to share their work. And then uh, I was like, there's no favicon. And of course, every website needs a favicon in order to be a website. So uh, I was like, you know, I'll just slap some Times New Roman, or it was not even Times New Roman, it was just Times uh, italic in, to like a white box, italicized it. Uh, the program was called Viz uh, for Visual Arts. And then that became kind of an identity that I think like in a program that was like very much in an art school or visual arts is kind of painting, sculpture, photography. Um, I was kind of using that as an opportunity to generate um, moments to actually practice as a designer when kind of I didn't have those naturally. And I think what's been really exciting is seeing that take on a life of its own with other students kind of creating, like, as next to you, for example, creating uh, books that were like senior thesis books, um, et cetera. So it's been great to kind of just see that evolve over time. Um, so you mentioned folks might be in the thick of or wrapping up thesis and that just kind of drove a spike of anxiety through me because I am in the midst of it and I think in terms of constraints I am limited by my own ability with certain technical things and so how do you get over some of the hurdles that maybe you can't cross and you have to pivot. So if there's any tips, because I'm. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to be honest with yourself, right? I think we're all just doing our best. We're all just happy to be here, right? So um, I think like something that like, it's funny because we're like, Michael and I are kind of in the same process with all of you guys over there on how do you scope a project successfully so that you can actually get it done in the time that you have. And I'd say like a lot of it boils down to having kind of a core idea and kind of there's like a big project and a lot of different moving parts, but usually there's never, there's usually at least one specific core idea that like the essence of the project boils down to. And um, understanding what that is and how you might be able to get there. And you know, if it's like super technical, then it's like, how do you kind of fake it to get the idea across, right? So um, something that like we talk about in class is how presentations are your moment to kind of drive and like have your version of the story, so to speak. And so famously, Steve Jobs, when he announced the iPhone, had a very specific path that he had to follow. Uh, otherwise, the entire phone would crash on, on stage. So kind of also like a little bit of smoke and mirrors and it's just really about like getting the idea and storytelling across, I'd say, is also as important as the technical execution. All right, thank you everyone for giving us your Thursday night. Again, our next lecture is on Thursday, April 4th with Sylvia LaRusso. One more time, Eric Lee. Thank you.